I'd like to invite to the stage uh, our panelists. So, Kerry Smith uh, from Hayward, Adrian Ash from Billion Vault, Ronald Peter Stoffler, who we heard from earlier today from Incrementum, Florian Siegfried from SSI Asset Management, and John McCluskey, uh, who's the CEO and director of Alamos Gold and our sole corporate uh, issuer on the stage. Um, but what a great spread across the expertise and sort of roles within mining and investing for gold. Um, so we're going to put to rights exactly where we're at in the gold sector at the moment, provide you some analysis. And of course, if you have a question, put your hand up and we'll get, we'll, we can ask around for our panel. So uh, thanks for joining me, gentlemen. Um, Adrian, I wanted to start with you as perhaps a new speaker for one-to-one, -one, first time you've come to our conference as well. Um, and wanted to get your sort of take on uh, where we're at in the gold cycle What's been holding gold back in particular as well? And is this precipitous moment that we've all been waiting for around the corner or is it some way off? And, and what could be the trigger for that? Um, well, I, I mean, I think it's important to say, first of all, that gold has done pretty well this year. Um, I mean, I think when you compare bullion prices to any other tradable asset except energy, um, gold has actually done pretty well. If you look at it in dollar terms, yeah, you think, okay, it's down, I think uh, 12 months to date, about seven percent, six percent in U.S. dollar terms. If you look at it X dollar, so if you deflate current gold price by the dollar index, it's up twelve percent year on year. So I think really that's the story that we've had in 2020 is the dollar and particularly interest rates. And so you know a lot of people say, oh hang on, we've had a war in Europe. We've still got a war in Europe. Uh, we've got inflation at four decade highs. Why isn't gold soaring? And I think you have to look at it the other way around. And you say you've had the steepest rise in dollar interest rates since 1980, 81. Um, you've had the dollar at two decade highs. And yet gold really hasn't done that badly. Um, and I think the broader point, I mean, the way that I personally look at gold, a lot of our customers at Bullion Vault look at it is as a diversification tool as part of a broader portfolio, physical bullion. Um, and I think when you look at it in that way, there are some years when nothing works. And 2022 has been one of those years. And the reason for that has been the steep rise in interest rate. And all asset prices have performed very, very poorly. Equities, of course, bonds, notably, crypto, um, most commodities outside the energy space. Um, and so gold, I think, has done really pretty well. And I, the comparison I would make for this year about you know how you know, has, why has gold underperformed, or however you want to look at it, is 2013, when gold lost 25% in three months in dollar terms. And that, if you remember, if you cast your mind back, was all about the Fed were going to start tapering, then they were going to start raising rates, and gold crashed. Um, the move in rates this year has been a lot steeper in real terms, in real rates, in tips. Um, so gold, as I say, has, I think has done tolerably well all things considered. Yeah, indeed. And what do you think, without being too much of a crystal ball, <laughs> um, do you think there's a, that precipitous moment that I mentioned that's around the corner? You know, is it going to be a Fed-triggered uh, easing that's going to kick it into gear maybe yeah. early I mean, next year? I mean, everybody's <clears throat> praying for a Fed pivot. I mean, we saw that on the US CPI data the other week. Um, you know, suddenly markets are soaring because, oh, wow, you know, the CPI inflation rate has come off a little bit, it's not rising anymore, the Fed are going to go. And the Fed have said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, I think the problem that gold has had this year in terms of investor interest, and by investor interest I mean large investor inflows, and generalist fund managers, and that's what really moves the gold price. You know, the gold price doesn't move because a lot of private investors are buying coin. All that tends to do is move the premiums on coin higher. Um, it tends to move when you have large inflows of cash coming in from generalist fund managers who aren't otherwise looking at precious metals. And same on the way out, we saw this in 2013. All that money came out of the gold ETFs because the generalists went, oh, okay, financial crisis is over, the Fed's going to turn and start tightening instead. I don't need gold anymore. So I think that's the problem that gold faces at New Year 23, is what's it going to take for the generalist investment community fund management and wealth managers to look at gold and say, okay, this is actually what we need for 2023. And I don't know what the trigger is for that. I think certainly in discussions that I've had recently, people are telling me, well, I'm just going to buy index linkers. I'm going to buy inflation-linked bonds. 
um, okay, well, good luck with that. Because you've got to get enough of them, firstly. I mean, it's pretty tight supply unless you're in the UK, where for some reason government decided to issue what, 25 percent of our debt index linked uh, compared to what, 8% in the States, 5% in Europe. Um, that's a very small market, and I forget, was it Ruffer? Somebody at Ruffer suggested, you know, gold is index linked on steroids. You know, if, if you're buying in inflation linked bonds because you like the outlook for that, basically stagflation, then you really want to go for gold. I think once that message gets through, and I think once the, stag the stagflationary idea really takes hold and people start to pick that apart and look at it in more depth, then I think gold will start to appeal to that broader, to the people outside this room, because they're the guys who move the price. Yep, excellent. Ronnie, um, harking back to your presentation earlier today, you were talking about some of the recessionary pressures that are coming through being a bit too much perhaps for the Fed and that they're going to change their tact quite soon, at least we're all hoping. Um, what do you think, do you still stand by that in terms of what that's going to do to the gold price for next year? Do you have any um, more that you can add to that? Well, that was basically the the core of my my thesis this morning and 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 i just don't see it perhaps i'm a, a poor investor a poor economist but um you know the fed balance sheet is up 50 percent since 2020 us non-financial uh, uh debt is up 60 percent up to 65.4 trillion i think uh and now we've seen within eight months uh interest rates rising by 375 basis points i don't see that a recession won't happen in such an environment where we basically have the, the most interest rate sensitive um, environment ever. So I think that inflation is basically the story of 2022, but a recession is the story of 2023. And, and we crunched the numbers actually um, for, for the 2019 in gold, which was reported and analyzed how gold does in different um, stages of a recession. Because actually, normally when the recession is announced, the worst is already over. And uh, in the earlier stages of a recession, actually gold is doing pretty well. Why? Because that's a time when fiscal and monetary stimulus um, is announced. So, so from my point of view, gold will be one of the main beneficiaries of the pivot. I, I said this morning that Jay Powell will be nominated for the Academy Awards. Um, I don't buy into this hawkish narrative. Obviously, the market still believes that Jay Powell is the new Paul Foker. I don't. And I think if markets realize, well, actually, that, that the pivot will be happening and the pivot will definitely be different than the 2018 pivot, I think that gold will probably want, be one of the primary beneficiaries. Because let's face it, for, for the general equity markets going forward, I think... Uh, you know, earnings will continue to be downgraded. So, so far, nothing has really happened. We're not seeing very cheap valuations in U.S. equity markets. So I think that gold should, on a relative basis, um, profit much more from this upcoming pivot than uh, in the previous one. Mm -hmm. Is there a buying opportunity right now, then, across gold, but then also the equities and the, and the mining companies, you know? Kerry, maybe I can turn to you in terms of your view of uh, valuation across the sector um, and relating the mining issuers uh, back to where we're at with the macro. So, you know, in the, I've been in this business since 1992. I have never seen stocks as cheap as they are, well, let's say over the last two, three years. And I think part of the problem is there is a small investor, there's a small portfolio management base with gold funds, dedicated gold funds. And, and those funds are shrinking, their assets under management are shrinking, and they have a core holding of names. They can't look at new names because they have to sell a name they already have if they want to look at a new name. And, uh, you know, we're talking, we're, we're fish in a, in a fishbowl. We're talking to a small number of clients, and they don't have the capital to invest. So I think, I think you're right. The, uh, you know, we need the, we need the generals. We, we know that. And I think... The last couple of cycles, the last couple of rallies has been to 2000 and the pullback that happened in March. It happened late last year as well. And, uh, and in both those rallies, I think we did start to see some generalist money come into the space, but we didn't sustain the rally. And you know, three weeks later or four weeks later, the gold price is back down 150 or $200. And those guys, those investors all sold and they've kind of walked. And so they've had two kicks at the can here in the last six or nine months. So I personally think that we need to get gold 
you know, well through $2,000 and sustained there before we can get the journalists back. And I think we need the journalists to leave because, you know, we can't do it with, with the investable assets that we've got in the AUM we've got in the sector. It's, it's just not big enough to move the needle, to be quite honest. So, you know, I think, I think it's coming. I think the, you know, the market, the stocks are now starting to lead the, the gold price. I've seen that in the last couple of three weeks. Gold will be down modestly in a day and a lot of the stocks will be up modestly on that day. And we haven't seen that for a long time. So I think that that is a start that's constructive. And I think that's some generalist buying because, um, you know, that's not the gold funds moving it because they don't have the deployable capital really to move the stocks, I don't think. Certainly. Florian, do you want to comment as a gold fund on the equity side and, you know, this buying opportunity present? Um, what's your view? Yeah, um, I think um, the headwind um, for gold has been clearly rates and more specifically the, the yield curve because all of a sudden you get like, for let's say, two-year treasuries from zero, you get like 4.4%. So gold has competition as an asset class and I think the generalist investor was really clear if I can decide after 10 years of um, zero yield, I get 4.5% all of a sudden, should I buy gold or, or this? Of course, you go for the yield stuff. So <clears throat> I think that's, um, that's the dynamics um, uh, which has surprised all of us, but I think it's a reality and gold has been in competition. So for gold to get back, um, you know, more, uh, to gain some interest from the investment community, more specifically from the ETFs, because they seem to be like the, the sellers in that market. Um, we have, you know, we have to get back through some sort of a normalized yield curve where things start to normalize, and hopefully, or I would say so, this is a process that will take time. So that's the first. For the equity specifically, I think. Um, Inflation is, is the key um, headwind, what's keeping the investment community or more specifically the generalists away from the sector. Because the question is, why is gold performing relatively badly compared, let's say, to the energy patch, which has been clear outperformer, gold doing nothing. Um, and the second is, of course, then cost inflation. So ASIC are probably up $100, $200 a year, margin getting off. Um, and so it's really like, why should I buy into an industry that um, enjoys a relatively high price, but now gets squeezed by costs? So what I think must happen is like a transition from that inflationary uh, environment to something more normal or even deflationary environment where gold is on the relative terms doing pretty well against oil or energy or all sorts of costs. And um, I think that's more complex probably for an investor to understand. So um, oil has come off from 120 to 80, so it's some relief, but I think it takes time for the market to actually see how they how this will eat through profits and increased cash flows here. I think you don't necessarily want to see a, a, a high gold price because what happens is you get all the crappy projects financed <laughs> and in the end you get the same criticism you raise money but you were not able to show the returns so i think if the gold price stays where it is um, it puts more pressure or more discipline on the producers to actually come up with projects which can demonstrate this is a mine that can work at 17 or 16 or 1800 dollars we are not depending on a marginal um, two thousand dollar sort of deposit so it's tough and um, but i think the dynamics are here to probably see us getting into an environment like this um, but first and foremost i think um, the yields they have to normalize in, in 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 order to get the generalists back interested in into gold yep excellent explanation and, and, and maybe just one other thing to what Florian's saying. I mean, I've never seen gold stocks with the yields that we see today on the producers. Yep. It, you just have never seen that, you know, 4 or 5% yields. And the S&P is yielding 2%. Rates are 4%. So I think, you know, gold stocks do have some attributes that the generalists can start to look at as long as they're comfortable they can sustain yep. those dividends. And I think, I think that they can. Yeah, excellent. Well, look. 
great time to bring in John uh, our issuer and maybe touch on some of the points that particularly Florian raised there you know around the cost inflation and how that's uh, how you're navigating that as a, in your business but then also the attributes of you know uh, you're one of the larger companies that are here um, and you know this is not a terrible gold price to be uh, producing at you know so you can see from um, I don't know this is working Are we on yeah thanks cool. You can see from uh, just all the published information from the analysts over the last few quarters that uh, all unsustaining costs have been rising right across the sector. Uh, so majors who, you know, a couple of years ago were were targeting a thousand dollar all unsustaining costs for their production, they look more like twelve hundred, twelve fifty now, and uh, that's been a direct result of, of rising input costs. You've seen diesel prices go up, you've seen labor uh, costs go up. Those are two big components. But all the other all the other commodity inputs, uh, whether you're talking about you know, cyanide for gold producers, uh, things like lime, uh, cement, so on, all the things that, uh, that you need to produce, that you need to construct with, um, all those costs are going up. And um, unlike, uh, I said this somewhat jokingly to my colleague earlier today, but unlike um, other businesses that can pass their costs directly along to their to their consumers, the gold industry tends to pass its high cost along to its uh, its poor investors who have to deal with uh, the poor results that uh, that, that come out of uh, a rising cost environment. So, what can you do to uh, buck that? That's that's the big question. And um, in in our case, we've managed to do so, and that's really been tied to productivity gains. And that takes um, some foresight and it takes some investment. And in, in sort of the first example I would give uh, in, in Alamos, we invested roughly $350 million um, increasing the capacity of our young Davidson mine from about 3,800 tons a day when we took it over to 8,000 tons a day where it is now. The net result is we bought our costs down. Um, so our, our margins have increased substantially and now we're generating about 100 million in free cash flow a year from that operation. We're doing the same thing with our Island Gold project. We've sort of ramped it up in, in two small steps since we acquired it, taking it from just under 100,000 ounces of gold a year to roughly 150 where we sit now. But now we're in the process of investing the money to double that again, to double it to 300,000 ounces of gold a year. And then you get the economies, economies of scale working on, on your behalf and, um, and the consequences you can bring the cost down. According to the study on Island Gold, we should bring our costs down to sub $600 an ounce. So the margins are actually going to grow. We've seen that at our Mulattos operation where we've uh, brought in a, a new mine called Liaki Grande. It's, um, it being a new mine, the uh, strip is very, very low. Recoveries are very, very high. Um, net result is our costs have dropped from close to $1,000 an ounce uh, at Mulattos, uh, down below $900 an ounce, and they're going to continue to decline. So unless you're doing that, unless you're investing in, um, in making your operations uh, lower cost, you're just going to have a margin squeeze. And I think that's what's going to happen um, for the large part uh, across the sector. And you're going to see mines close, and some mines will just not be able to withstand the rising costs. But if you're, um, you know, fortunate enough to be in the position that we're in, uh, we're we're actually benefiting from uh, the the competitive environment that we're in. Yeah, absolutely, um, Portuitis. What does that do for your strategy in terms of going forward? You know, is there some consolidation maybe needed in the sector, and that leads me obviously to the M and A question: um, Is it an opportunity for perhaps you as one of the um, the largest surviving companies to look at strategic acquisitions to sort of continue that that production life cycle that um, within uh, your portfolio. Well, we've been very active on the M and A front, but we tend to get active when things are at their worst. You know, so when um, we got started, we were just a little company uh, in in two thousand one, two thousand two, uh, when the gold price was under three hundred dollars an ounce. Probably a lot of people in this room that can't even remember that. But uh, when gold was down that low, you can't imagine the kind of deals uh, that were available. So we picked up the, um, 
the Malatos mine from Placer Dome for what turned out to be eight million Canadian dollars plus a royalty. Now we've gone on to produce two and a half million ounces of gold from that uh, project. We've generated something like five hundred million dollars in free cash flow. Uh, we've paid out something like one hundred and twenty million dollars in dividends just from that mine. So we actually generated more and gave back more in dividends from our investors than we originally raised to build the mine. We raised $72 million to build the mine. So stories like that, um, they, they tend to evolve out of the, 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 worst, uh, the worst stage that, that the market hits. When gold retreated again from $1,900 down to about $1,100 an ounce, that's when we stepped in and did the merger of equals with uh, Orico Gold effectively doubling the size of the company overnight. And um, a couple of years later, in 2017, we acquired Richmond Mines that brought in the, uh, the Island Gold project. Again, gold was at $1,285 an ounce. So those, those big downturns in the gold price, that's when the opportunities generally present themselves. So where are we today? Well, we're not really in a, as you were pointing out, Kerry, there's not really a big downturn in the gold price, but there's been a huge contraction in valuations across the sector, producers and, and non-producers. The non-producers have been hit the hardest. I mean, some of those great discoveries that, you know, some of the companies out here, for example, uh, are, 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 you know, shepherding uh, exploration projects into multi-million ounce discoveries. And um, they're trading at 0.3 times their net asset value. So if we're trading at, say, 0 0.85, 0 0.9, that's about where we are today, certainly there's a deal to be done if, uh, and, and even a premium to be paid if we're looking at something trading at, at 0 0.3 times its net asset value. So, you know, are we looking? You bet. We're, we have to be looking. But we also have to be very careful in terms of uh, what we acquire because there's something broken in the market right now. And... I illustrate it this way. If, if you take a typical M&A transaction, what happens? There's this massive hedge fund sector, and they go long the target, and they go short the acquirer. So you could find your stock down you know, 10 to 20% on the first day of your acquisition. Well, what company can, um, can afford to have a 10 to 20% reduction in the gold price right now? Well, there was a time when we were willing to take that risk. For example, when we acquired Richmond Mines, our stock dropped 16% on the first day. That was a hell of a hit. And in fact, over the, over the year that followed, our stock was down close to 40%. You know, that's how badly the market was, uh, you know, was taking a, a, an acquisition like that. And the generalist investors just didn't have the capital to push it back the other way. So the hedge funds enjoy just pushing it down and profiting all the way. But um, now, if we were to do something similar, well, now we, now we own Island Gold, and we own Young Davidson, and those are two of the best gold assets in Canada. Are we willing to jeopardize losing what we've already put together to make that next acquisition? Well, as long as I'm running the company, the answer is no. You know, so we've got to be in a position to acquire something and use a very significant cash component. And unless we can do that, we're, we're not going to just uh, put out a deal where, where we're issuing, say, tens of millions of shares to acquire an asset because we'll just be, we'll just be picked off, I think. Yep. And shareholders are broadly happier this cycle with the way that producers have performed in terms of cash flow, returning uh, dividends and that kind of thing um, versus the last cycle where M&A went to or AWOL, as we know. Um, the last cycle ended with a flurry of M&A transactions that started to happen about the time gold hit $1,800 an ounce and continued at a pretty rapid, rapid pace right through the top. Um, there was a lot of value destroyed then. I mean, there's some, some classic stories. I'm not going to repeat them. I don't want to embarrass anybody. <laughs> but uh, there was some massive... Uh, losses generated from those deals. I mean, companies that were, were trading at their peaks and, and, and doing those deals, you know, within three or four years, the CEO was fired, the stocks were down 60%. Um, it was a calamity. 
and, and generalist investors who had come into the sector on the buoyancy of that rising gold price, they were hit hard. And um, when they liquidated those positions, they liquidated with the idea of not getting back in anytime soon. And I don't think they've come back yet. Do you, Carrie? No, I don't. No, they're not. So, I think they're still on the sidelines watching. Exactly. So I think Kerry is, is correct. It's going to take at least $2,000 gold and a sustained $2,000 gold to bring that broader spectrum of investors back to the sector. But I was going to say, just to put it into perspective, I mean, we're at 1750 today, call it rough numbers, to get to 2000 and sustain that. It's not a big move percentage-wise. It's 12% or something. So, you know, to get that kind of move is not out of the realm of reality from my perspective. And if you get that kind of a move and you sustain that, then I think that that's when you will see this. Because the market's been a tale of two tapes. I think the producers have done pretty well. As you said, the gold price is strong. They're making great margins. They're paying dividends. They're you know, building out their projects. They're spending capital on new projects. They're growing. Whereas the, the developers and the explorers have had no access to capital or very little unless they have you know, some deep pocket that's prepared to fund them. And so their valuations, as John mentioned, have come, you know, you've got developers with decent projects that could be built, but nobody wants to, to build it. Uh, nobody wants to finance it to build it, pardon me. And the producers aren't really in a position, you know, I mean, Barrick's not gonna buy some single asset, I don't care if it's five million ounces, unless it's in one of their core districts, they're not gonna buy it. So. The number of buyers are smaller. The industry is shrinking because there has been consolidation. I mean, the number of mid-tiers now compared to 2011 is probably down 25, 30%, right? So, you know, I, you know, if you look back at 2010, 2011, the gold price went to 1923. The oil price went to 140. People forget that. And, you know, what killed, what killed the trade was the gold stocks led the bullion down because the gold stocks got the margin squeeze because of the high oil price. And that's when everything kind of rolled over and went to hell in a handbasket, to be honest. So, you know, we've, we've been 10 years trying to rebuild back the space. I think generally the producers are in pretty good shape. You know, financially, their balance sheets are good. Their operations are running pretty well. And, the, you know, the next leg in the cycle, I think, is trying to figure out how you grow. Can you grow organically from the projects you have in your pipeline? You know, you guys have some organic growth, obviously, that island, Lynn Lake. And uh, some of the other companies are going to be looking for projects. And at some point, there will be, I think, a convergence of valuations. But right now, I, you know, I, feel, I feel for the, for the juniors because it is tough to raise capital. And, uh, and the valuations are very modest. And you know, could M&A happen? Sure, it could. But John's right. I think the deals that generally get the best acceptance in the market are cash deals. And uh, you know, generally, the producers don't want to spend a lot of their cash on an M&A deal unless it makes a lot of sense. So I think what you're going to see is the, uh, the uh, premiums are going to be far more modest than uh, anything we've seen in the past. And uh, that's just for starters. I mean, like, you're not going to see these big, massive takeouts uh, that occurred, I recall, between 2010 and 2013. About 40% premiums. Pretty standard, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. You're just not going to see that now. Few circumstances you may, um, but it's got to be a hell of a prize and probably multiple bidders driving that premium. Uh, except for those rare circumstances, you're going to see relatively modest premium take for, for, for whatever it's taken out, and only um, only the producers will will enjoy those uh, those double digit premiums. You know, getting into the 25, 30 percent range. If it's a if it's a non-producer. It's it's going to be it's going to be tough to uh, to get better than a twenty percent premium. Okay. Florian, I'm going to turn back to you just to talk about what kind of companies do you like in your fund at the moment, or do you look at? Um, you obviously meet with a lot of juniors, know the sector, um, and Kerry, maybe you can say what you know the investors that you speak with, who you're advising, you know, near stage development um, projects, you know, are, are they not as attractive anymore? Surely they're a little bit shielded from some of the operational costs. Um, and, uh, you know, is there is there value there um, rather than just sort of the earlier exploration plays that are finding it harder to sort of prove themselves to the market? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think generally um, when I put this whole market into context with 
and you know passive investments, which is obviously dominating every asset class today. Uh, I think what happened over the last five, six years um, is like the gold matrix. They had to play that game. Um, you know, they merged, uh, they consolidated uh, to be part of the index funds. And I think that is what happened. And on average, probably seniors trade at, I don't know, let's put the numbers, seven times EV EBITDA. Um, the question is that they're fully priced, probably yes, based where gold is trading, where costs are. Um, but when you go down the food chain uh, into the mid caps and then, then into the small caps, I think there is obviously a valuation compression in that area, um, which is for me, and I think that was mentioned before in the panel, um, a function of active funds leaving the space. The reality is today the biggest investor in the gold space are passive, so they don't look at fundamentals. They, move, they go down on, on, on market cap not really on catalysts and valuations. So my gut feeling would say that's for somebody who's, you know, you know, looks for relative value in the space, uh, you definitely want to have a closer look at, at the mid caps and more specifically at, at some of the junior producers. And then also at the developers. Um, um, I think when M&A comes into play and you put like, let's, Let's take some recent transactions of, uh, of uh, Agnico and Yamana uh, when you put like a, a t price tag on what they pay per resource sounds at Canadian Malartic, it's, 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 it's a relatively high number. Mm -hmm. um, so they are paying two and a half billion dollars for um, a reserve of 1.8 million. So that's around $1,400 per ounce. Of course, it's easy to mine. It's all there, but this is like what the market is willing to pay because obviously there is a lack of new discoveries so you have to acquire and then my question would be what do you pay um, if you get exposed to let's say uh, a developer probably valuations are much lower three hundred dollars two hundred dollars an ounce that's subject to project but there is in this market obviously a relative uh, compression in price in the developer space. And I think, the, the, of course, the, the result is, or, or, the, or the, the, the reason for that is that the market seems to think these projects will not get funding because rates are high, gold prices are not doing so well. Um, so I think, yeah, I look more into, you know, the lower cap market uh, space. Um, it's very liquid at the moment. But if the market turns around and um, because th those stocks, they have always, you know, they need the sort of catalysts to get them going again. So they need, you know, a few good quarters, the next drill hole, the next permit. This is what will move them. If you're an, an active investor, you should look for that. If you're a passive investor, you're not interested in that. So I think it really depends on what you are and what you look. So, but for me, it's definitely much more exciting especially if valuations are so low. Most companies have no debt. Trading at, I don't know, $100, $200 a reserve ounce, there is value in the space. So, some money to deploy here? Absolutely. Excellent. Kerry, did you have any other points to add on that? Well, I mean, you've got a lot of these developers in what I would argue are pretty safe jurisdictions trading at, you know, 15 to 20 bucks an ounce on the ground on a resource basis, which is probably the lowest I've ever seen it, to be quite honest, over the years. I mean, it, at times in the cycle, it can trade a multiple to that. And I think Florian's right. The uh, you know the valuations of the, the juniors and the intermediates are lower, for sure, than, than the seniors. And at least with the juniors and the intermediates, you do have growth. And there's the option, you know, there's the optionality for growth. You don't really have much growth in the, in the seniors. I mean, if you're Barrick, and your Barrick's VP of expiration, and uh, you produce 4 million ounces a year, that poor guy has to get up every Monday morning and say, what am I going to do today to replace the 100,000 ounces that we mine today? Like, that's a frightening thought. So if you're, a, if you're a junior or you're a developer, I think what you need to do is you need to position your project as best as you can to, uh, to look attractive, because at some point, there is a reserve replacement issue that's coming. And that, that wall, is it's not a tiny wall. For some of these companies, it's a big wall. But 
you know, expiration, generally the companies have been pretty good at replacing ounces. I mean, look at what John's done at Ireland. I mean, they bought that project with a million ounces or less maybe. It's four, four or five, 5.1. And I mean, I've, I've published, I think it's gonna be multiples of that. So, you know, I think that if you buy an asset and you, you understand the geology, I think that you can, over time, you can grow the resource significantly and the reserve significantly, and you can get multiples in terms of returns on your investment. And you know, to be honest, Ireland's a great example of that because when they bought it, they were you know, pretty vilified in the market over it. People said, oh, you paid too much. And I think if anybody looked back at that acquisition today, you have to say that that ha has to have been one of the best acquisitions in the space in Canada. And uh, you know, I think the, you know, right now there's lots of cheap developers out there that are in first world, pardon me, first world countries. I don't think you need to need to run off as an investor to look at investing in a developer that's in some third world country. There's no valuation difference today in any of those companies from, from what I see. Okay, fantastic. We sort of covered the macro and then scaled down through the tiers. Uh, does anyone have a question for our panel at all? Does anyone want to pose a question to anyone on the sector or perhaps on the um, the macro questions as well? I had something that I wanted to pose actually to everyone based around um, something that I'd heard from our New York conference last month around sort of inflation perception being perhaps more of a psychological factor than the actual inflation itself. And this uh, one fund manager there was saying that they actually track inflation perception quite closely um, and based around the idea of like the faith in the Fed, you know, will they fix this situation? And it seems to be that there's a sort of, like you mentioned, Jay Powell having, uh, you know, the, the, the Oscar or the, uh, the Academy Award, um, you know, uh, how long can that go on for? And do you think inflation for perception um, is, is quite an important metric um, in terms of what we're looking at within the gold space? Uh, I mean, inflation is the topic at the moment. Yeah, I mean, if, if you talk to friends, colleagues, family, everybody's talking about inflation. Yeah, that's that's like the topic. And, and I think this is what what central banks really fear. It's, it's in technical terms, it's called um, inflation expectations, expectations becoming unanchored. Um, and I think this is really the reason why, why the Fed really tries to appear very, very hawkish. Um, now, I think from, from my point of view, as I've said, and, 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 and I'm, I'm experiencing that when I'm talking to, uh, to companies, for example, one mining company today said that actually um, their drilling costs are already down 15% compared to, to, to last year. So, so I think, first of all, it is our job as business owners to, to adapt and to uh, make the best out of this challenge. And I think there's many good uh, business owners that actually uh, got their plans and, and, and really um, uh, try to make the best out of the uh, inflation that they're experiencing. And on the second hand, I think if we see uh, a recession happening, and this is actually my, my, my base case, yeah, because we're seeing the ISM below 50, uh, we're seeing the biggest inversion uh, in the yield curve for, for, for many decades. We're seeing that earnings are uh, rolling over now. Uh, we're seeing, um, obviously, the, the, the real estate market rolling over in the United States. So, so uh, for me, it's crystal clear that we are facing into a res uh, that we're heading into a recession and recessions aren't disinflationary per definition. So, so therefore, I think that for this inflation wave, we've seen the worst, actually. And the reason for me, I mean, I'm, I'm traveling quite a lot, is wherever you go to, if it's Vienna, Zurich, Frankfurt, London, actually the restaurants and, and, and the shops, they are all full. Yeah. So, so I think... Pand uh, pandemic hangover, maybe. Uh, <laughs> perhaps. Um, on the other hand, perhaps we, we just don't know how it feels to, to save money and to, to adjust our spending behavior. We're, we're, we're pretty much addicted to, to consumption. And I think this is going to change within the course of, of, of this upcoming recession. But I fear... And this is basically the take from the 2020 um, um, uh, uh, episode that actually we will be facing much, much more fiscal stimulus. So, so I think that um, politicians all around the globe in 2020 found out, well, actually, you know, all those government checks work pretty well and people like it. They reelect us. So, so I think going forward, we should focus much less on central bank 
um, actions and focus more on, on a fiscal stimulus. So, so this is kind of what I'm seeing uh, coming. But as I've said in my keynote, you know, inflation is something that we as business owners, as investors, as consumers will learn to live with. Um, and I think that once inflation numbers come down, it will release lots of pressure from central banks. They will say, we did it, yeah, we killed inflation. And obviously then I think this should be the point in time when, when also the gold price should be doing better because this, this extreme hawkishness that is being discounted in markets will, will be kind of, will be priced out. So, so that's kind of my, my roadmap. Excellent. Adrian, could I pull you yeah, to comment? Um, I mean, I think, running bang on, for me personally, you know, gold um, as an inflation play simply isn't how it's worked for the last 20 years. I mean, gold has tended to do better um, in periods of financial stress and deflation fears. I mean, we've seen that throughout the 21st century, and gold remains the best performing asset class of the 21st century, and it's been underlying. So, you know, whether we're seeing a spike, which is now we're on the other side of, whether it's actually the first peak within a multi-peak wave of inflation, which goes on, I think there's, you know, there's good reason to think that might be true. Um, the fact that gold hasn't performed amazingly well this year, uh, interesting comment from um, Matt Slater at UBS at the LBMA conference earlier this year. And he said, yeah, the thing with gold's safe haven appeal is that it's not actually empirical, it's cultural. People aren't going to stop turning to gold in times of financial crisis or inflationary stress or whatever it might be, macro stress, because it didn't do so well in one year. They're going to return to it because there's 5,000 years of history and this is what people do. Um, so I think the appeal is very strong there, and I think, as Ronnie says, you know, once the the broad reality of financial stress comes through from the you know the higher level, you know, whatever happens to inflation, we're at much higher cost of living now. And I think I don't think that's going to retreat. Um, just an interesting point, though, I wanted to come back on what John was saying about you know uh, the kind of feast famine that we've seen repeatedly in our industry. I mean, this is the problem for any part of the supply chain in gold that you work in. You know, there's booms and busts. What's interesting right now, I think, is that the gold price in dollar terms this year is actually a record high average at 1800. And what's really interesting, I think, and I haven't seen this commented on much, is that global jewelry demand has come back at $1,800 an ounce. Right. So you're actually now back at pre-COVID levels. You know, huge crash, obviously, in 2020, both for India and particularly China. But even with China's lockdowns continuing, um, and even with the obvious pressure on household budgets that you've seen globally, but you know this is going to be true in East Asia as well, you've now got global jewelry demand back at the same level as it was, at a much higher price. Yeah, that's why equities being such a bargain in these... Yes, is, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Well. Yeah, and, the, and so, I mean, certainly going into 2023, we you know we've looked at what the ball case might be. But in terms of what the downside protection, I think this might be something which appeals to generalists, going back to those guys again, is that they start to say, well, actually, what's the downside on gold? Well, given that jewelry demand is back where it was pre-COVID, but at, what, $500 higher? Um, I think that's, you know, that's a really strong support. This isn't 2013. You know, Asian households are not waiting for the price to dump by three, $400 before they buy. Excellent. What about this generational um, addiction to spending? <laughs> Is that you must have some insights from Billion that come in terms of like you know people buying and sort of like where the markets are uh, are interested and in, in generationally. You know, uh, as that crypto bubbles burst, is there, is there something coming through there for no. for gold and precious no, metals? But it, but it hadn't gone away. Um, I mean, we looked at this you know ten years ago repeatedly. We had customers, lots of people saying to us, "When are you going to do crypto?" Ne never. Um, and I think if you look at the evidence, even when Bitcoin was absolutely going gangbusters, I just don't see any evidence that gold as a choice of asset class was suffering. If anything, I think they were working symbiotically. I think, you know, the uh, runner and I were discussing earlier just how the idea of Bitcoin has really revived and educated people on the whole idea Financial of literacy, and, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think financial literacy, whilst it's proven very costly to some people who have got cash at FT FTX, um, they've learned a good lesson, um, but more broadly in the conversation, and I think within you know discourse, investment discourse more broadly, people now think about well, actually, you know, how do things work? 
how do financial markets work? How does that interact with what is money? Um, so I think if anything, um, I mean, really, you know, what was Bitcoin a competitor to? It wasn't gold, it was silver, because silver was always going to go to the moon, right? Silver was always going to go to 200 bucks. And that was the, you know, the moonshot. Gold has never been really promoted as that thing. Silver was, um, and silver might be again. Um, but uh, no, I mean, we've certainly, you know, we don't believe that we saw any deflection of private investment cash away from gold into crypto. And we certainly haven't seen anything on the other way either. Yep. Okay. I'm pretty much at time, but I just wanted to get your views uh, for gold next year. Um, not necessarily picking a price, but the trajectory is upwards. The only way is up. Are we feeling positive about, about the way things are going to go? So We're waiting from, for that moment. <laughs> from my perspective, I mean, I'm, I'm positively biased to gold because I think it's tested the lows here around 1,600 a couple of times. It's held in. And I kind of feel like the macro environment is supportive. So I'm positively biased. I don't have, you know, a target per se. Uh, I mean, we use 1900 for a long-term gold price, but it's just a number, right? Yep. But, um, you know, I kind of feel like the stocks are really where the value can be, you know. And, uh, and so I'm, you know, I'm kind of a price taker, to be honest, as an analyst. But uh, I think I have a positive bias for sure. Florian, any final word? Yeah, always difficult, of course, to uh, uh, make some predictions. We don't have a crystal ball, sure. unfortunately. But um, yeah, I think where, where we are, um, political uncertainty, I would assume, continues to be a driver for gold. And this is probably, unfortunately, not going away. Inflation remains. And one step, um, um, the dollar seems to be probably the most crowded trade <laughs> over the century. Um, if that um, starts to fade, um, um, uh, you know, the, the hot money, the, the algos and everything that has driven the dollar up and prices of gold down, they may, may reverse their buttons and soon um, they may start to buy gold and short the dollar. So what I want to say, it's, it's, it's difficult to digest what's coming, but the dollar seems, um, uh, you know, quite crowded if that goes down. Uh, and rates stabilize um, and uh, political uncertainty remains where we are. Um, I don't see why gold should be um, uh, not performing relatively well compared to risk asset classes. Yep. So, yeah. I got a question for. Oh, yes, please. Um, what do people see the impact of uh, Big Tank Zero COVID policy and all these lockdowns in China and supply chain issues in China? Yes, great. We haven't just, mentioned just China. Just pick up on me. <clears throat> Obviously, China has become the world's number one gold consumer nation. Um, everybody agrees that the People's Bank is probably buying a lot more gold than it officially reports. How long is a piece of string is the answer to that question as to how much more gold they've got than they report. But in terms of consumer demand, you know, I think China is probably going to be overtaken by India this year. And that's more because India has been released from... Uh, you know, 2021 was a huge bounce back in Indian gold demand, and yet it's continued. There's been a lot of substitution into silver this year, I think, because gold prices in India are very high in rupee terms, and you've also got very high import duty on gold in India as well. So there has been substitution there. But China is, has really come back as a group together. In India and China, their jewel demand, their household demand has really come back in gold. So even whilst the lockdowns, you know, the, the shutdowns in China continue, there still seems to be money going in. I think Chinese New Year will be something of a, a litmus test for that. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to see what the, uh, what the communist dictatorship does around Chinese New Year 23. Um, you know, are they really going to try and shut this down again? We know that there's you know, some beginnings of civil unrest um, and you know, just resistance to this coming through. And I think the Chinese New Year is such an important social family event, the biggest migration event globally. Um, and you know, that's been blocked 
And this will be the third year running that that's basically been shut down. So I think that could be a litmus test for as an event. Um, but in terms of the gold demand, it's certainly, it's not going away. It may be suppressed. It may be deflected for the near term. But I think, you know, medium to long term, I think Chinese household gold demand is is very much there. If if I may add, I think the 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 Xi pivot might might actually be more important than the Fed pivot, and I think this is slowly happening. Uh, of course, uh, Xi doesn't want to uh, lose his his face, and you know he has to do it very in a very diplomatic way. But it's happening, and and you know I think we over here in in, in Europe or the US we, we we tend to think that the center of the gold world is is here. Well, actually, if you have a look at gold production, if you have a look at gold consumption from private households, and if you look at central bank demand, well, actually, it's very much of an Asian story. And quite recently, we saw the biggest purchases in, in, in more than 20 years for, for the central banks. Well, maybe. It's an estimate. Yeah. <laughs> but there's, I mean, there's a huge unknown on that. Which, And I understand why the World Gold Council have that estimate. It makes perfect sense. Russian gold is not getting out of Russia. It's got to be going yeah. somewhere. Um, the CBR is certainly not buying it, so it's going to go somewhere. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is. And, it's and very you, much an estimate. On it. And you know, twenty fifth of, of February, when when the US, the EU, EU basically said, "Well, your six hundred and fifty uh, billion worth of currency reserves, you 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 Russians, is basically worthless." This is like the best advertisement that can happen for gold, because every country that is somewhat critical to the United States will actually say, "Well, okay." I'll probably need to diversify out of that, and 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 I think you need a a liquid and uh, a liquid asset that is accepted all over the globe, and and I think you know gold uh, is traded twenty four seven. It's got it's got a tight spread. It's accepted all over the globe, and the natural of inflation is one point six percent per year. So I think that's a very strong case for gold going forward. But again, I think we should focus perhaps less on what the Western world is doing and focus a little bit more on what Asia and the, the Arabic work, world is doing. Yep. Very interesting. Yes, please. Have we seen central bank responding to what you said on the 25th of February? Have we seen reserves switching into gold for US dollars? Because that is a natural response, and I see you talked about that. Well, I mean, we'd already had 50-year highs in central bank gold demand coming into the COVID crisis. I think 2018 was a record year on modern data basically since the collapse of the dollar gold exchange standard. Um, 2019 was then very strong again. 2020 was very quiet, central bank gold demand, because suddenly everyone's rushing to worry about other things. Um, but certainly 2021 and then, yes, 2022. I mean, on the World Gold Council estimates, which, as I say, I think makes sense, but it is very much an unknown to say that Q3, you saw, I think, 400 tons on their estimate. But it's a big black hole there of the gold's got to have gone somewhere. Um, I think what's interesting in terms of our central banks replacing their dollar reserves with gold, yes, to some extent, I think that is actually now happening. Whereas what you saw earlier over the last two decades was actually the emerging market central banks were able to build their dollar reserves and their gold reserves and everything else reserves because they were just being flooded with cash. Now that we are seeing certainly hiatus for globalization, if not a reversal, um, then I think those dollar flows are necessarily going to have to be you know, reduced. Um, China's not going to be taking in the dollar that it was. Um, and therefore, it becomes more of an active decision as to what they do in terms of reserves management. Um, certainly, you know, outside of the very big players, yeah, I think there's definitely been a move. If you look at Europe as well, Hungary, Poland, really, I mean, these are EU member nations buying large chunks of gold, which is kind of two fingers, frankly, to... The Brussels agreement Agenda. of you know well you know we all trust each other don't we we trust each other's currency because hey it's the same currency in Europe um, so why are you buying so much gold? Yep. and I think just one more thing um, there was a great interview with the with the head of the Dutch National Bank where we, he was asked okay you know your assets are going down what's going to happen if you uh, face negative equity and he says we can always uh, revalue our our gold positions yeah I thought it was. Pretty, pretty staggering to hear from a central bank representative. Yeah, definitely. Great questions. Excellent. Look, we're at five. I think uh, this is fantastic. What a, what a, 
um, coverage we've had and round of applause to our panel.